Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Protect X8 Online. My name is Roger Edwards, and I'm the Marketing Director of Protection Review. And on behalf of Kevin Carr, Joe Miller, and myself, we'd like to thank you so much for tuning in today. Whether you're watching this live on March the 20th, 2024, or indeed whether you're watching this as a replay at a later date. I'd also like to thank our partners for Protect X8, HSBC Life. The format for Protect X8 is exactly the same as normal. Seven speakers, seven minutes each, followed by a 30-minute debate with two guest panel speakers. Controversial topics, hot topics, Topics that we think will stimulate debate throughout the protection industry. And we'd like you to take part in that debate. So if you want to ask a question, follow up with a comment, or you've just got some general views on what the speakers and the panel guests are saying, please do post something on LinkedIn and use the hashtag ProtectX2024. That's ProtectX2024. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a couple of dates for your diary. Protect Z, which is our conference where every speaker is under the age of 30, takes place on June the 19th in central London. Now, our inaugural Protect Z event from last year was really popular and created a lot of very positive feedback from those who attended. So this year we're going bigger and better. If you'd like to attend, please do get in touch to book your place. And as always, towards the end of the year, we're back with the main Protection Review Conference, Dinner and Awards. This year, it's on Wednesday, the 27th of November. But as always, we are at the fabulous Landmark Hotel in London. Our topic today for Protect X8 is the humanity of protection, trust. Yeah, we're focusing in very heavily on trust this year. Do we do enough as an industry to engender trust amongst our customers? And it's not just our customers, it's across the whole of the supply chain, from the reinsurers to the product providers to the advisors and also the support service providers. And to get things started talking about the humanity of protection and trust, I'm delighted to introduce you to Shep Hyken. Shep is coming to us all the way from the United States of America. Shep is a customer services expert. He's also a prolific personality on LinkedIn. His video is full of ideas, it's fast paced, and you are really going to want to take some notes over the next seven minutes. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Shep Hyken. We need to talk about Customer experience. Now the theme for this online mini conference is the humanity of protection trust. Now trust and customer experience go hand in hand. Our annual state of customer service and experience research found that in 2024, 87% of customers and clients say a good customer service experience increases trust in the brands they do business with. In addition, an amazing customer experience gives you a competitive advantage. 83% of customers we surveyed are willing to switch brands because they know another company can provide a better customer service experience. And 88% say customer service is more important than ever. Now, those stats and findings are the setup for this presentation, which is a setup on how to create an amazing experience. As insurers, reinsurers, and financial advisors, I recognize that many of you will refer to your customers as clients. So as I'm going through this presentation, I'll be using the terms interchangeably. So with that in mind, here are seven strategies and tactics that will get you your customers and clients to say, I'll be back. Number one is how to create amazement. Now, amazement is not what you think it is. It's not about being over the top and creating an experience that just is, you know, as I mentioned, over the top, wow, uh, and what some might call incredible. Amazement is simply meeting expectations every time, 
And that's the hard part every time. In some cases, you can go a little bit better than average. And I often saying that a consistent and predictable, slightly above average experience that's consistent will get your customers to feel that you're amazing. So the point I'm trying to make is this. If all you are is just average, that doesn't get people to come back. You need to be at least on par with what their expectations are. And when customers and clients say things like, they're always so helpful, they're always so knowledgeable, they always get back to me quickly. That word always followed by something positive is what you're trying to achieve. Create a consistent and predictable experience that meets your customers and clients' expectations or focus on being just the tiniest little bit better than average and you'll find they come back again and again. All right, number two is to manage the moment. This is a powerful concept. Many years ago, Jan Carlson, the former president of Scandinavian Airlines, his airline was losing millions of dollars when he took over. But when he was finished, it was not just a successful airline, it was considered the most admired airline in the entire airline industry. And he did it with a simple idea called moments of truth. I refer to this as managing the moment because he defined the moment of truth as any time a passenger, which was his version of a customer or client, anytime a passenger came into contact with any aspect of the airline, they formed an impression. And he made it real clear that those impressions could be good and they could be bad. And I saw, thought to myself, well, that's a pretty good idea, but you know what? Let's add a third one. Let's add one in the middle. Obviously, we want to avoid bad uh, impressions. We want to avoid bad interactions. Those I refer to as moments of misery. But the ones in the middle, I refer to those as moments of mediocrity, if all you are is just okay, just average, just fine if it were. Fine is not fine, by the way. Fine is the F-bomb of customer experience. It's a four-letter word that starts with F, and if each letter represented a letter like an acronym, F would be a fake smile, I would be insincere feedback, N would be I never want to do business with you again, and E is, well, it's emotionless. I don't care for you, even though I smiled and said everything was fine. But I digress. That one in the middle is a moment of mediocrity. And then what you want to create consistently and predictably are what I refer to as moments of magic. And this is anything that is consistent with the customer's expectations. It's anything that's even the slightest bit better than average. Our goal is to create that consistent and predictable experience. That, as I mentioned before, it's like amazement where customers said, yep, you managed that experience for me and I am excited about continuing to do business with you. So number three is knowledge. And there's two types of knowledge. One is knowledge of the products and services that we sell. And that's very important because we need to come off as experts at what we do and understand not only our products, but also the industries in which we serve. And number two is to know who our customers and clients are. If they're doing business with us, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to have information about them at our fingertips in a CRM, customer relationship management type software, in their files where we can look and see how long they've done business with us, why they may have called in the past, the problems they had, whatever the issues are. You're all, uh, it's all about the knowledge that you have, not just of your information related to what you sell, but also about your customers and clients. Number four is communication. I love this one. I refer to this as asking the extra question. We can talk for days on communication, but I'm just going to give you this one simple idea. If somebody says, I need this quickly, don't say, okay, and then do it as fast as you can. Ask the question, how quickly? Like, how quickly do you need it? And they'll tell you. It's all about managing the experience. I often joke about my wife when one night she said to me, honey, would you like ice cream? And I said no and kept driving. She wasn't really asking me ice cream. I could have asked that extra question and said, no, but would you? And we would have saved the night. All right, number six, quick response. Show that you're paying attention and respond quickly. And remember, the quick response is determined by your customers and clients, not you. You might return a call or an email the next day. And while some people might say, wow, that was fast, others might say, what took you so long? So understand what your customers' expectations are and make sure you respond quickly and act like you care about them. And number seven is consistency. Consistency creates 
credibility. Inconsistency erodes confidence and trust. You need to make sure you deliver this similar experience, one that's either slightly above average consistently or one that's consistently meeting your customers' and clients' expectations. That consistency, as I mentioned, it creates confidence and it creates trust. And after all, trust is what part of this whole presentation and this whole mini conference is all about. Finally, I wanna share one more and that's a bonus. And that's simply to say, thank you. Thank your customers and clients and always let them know how much you appreciate them. And I wanna thank you for watching this presentation. Seven ideas in seven minutes. And don't just use these strategies and tactics for yourself. Share them with your teams at work. Create the experience that creates customers and clients that wanna come back, build confidence, and get them to say, I'll be back. Thank you for that high-powered presentation, Shep. Now we're going to move on to talk about artificial intelligence, AI. I think you'll agree this is a really hot topic. So please welcome our next speaker from Swiss Re, Dr. Lizzie Lubchansky. We need to talk about trust in AI. Everyone's talking about AI. Lots of people are using it, we think. But the question is, do people trust it? When trust and insurance is challenging enough, how can we ensure our customers and employees have digital trust? The ABI just launched its guide on responsible use of AI, the first insurer-specific guide. And with the regulator focusing on consumer duty, knowing how to approach AI with the best interest of the customer in mind is a question many of us are pondering. So today I'm going to talk about what these things are and what might be useful for insurers to know. AI is a type of predictive analytical models that are designed and trained for specific tasks. Advanced analytics have been enhancing the insurance value chain for years already, but AI has a huge potential to increase efficiency, develop new solutions and enable better customer outcomes. For example, it can automate repetitive knowledge tasks like claims triaging. It can generate insights from data to augment decision making such as improving underwriters' risk assessment. It can support marketing activities, policy servicing and finance processing, give customers more tailored coverage and simpler journeys. Generative AI specifically can address challenges such as in consumer engagement, high operational costs and slow pace of digital transformation. So there are potential benefits for customers, employees and businesses alike. On the face of it, everyone should be joining the AI club. However, while we need customers to be willing to provide their data for AI, employee commitment is also crucial for insurers to achieve these outcomes. The added value of AI only comes from a combination of AI models and human processes. So buy-in from underwriters, claims assessors and other users is crucial. Some recent articles on opinions on AI in insurance raised some red flags. Health and Protection reported that some underwriters are concerned about making themselves redundant if they participate in training AI models and are worried about needing to evolve themselves faster than computers. The Insurance Times reported that advisors are, are not willing to share sensitive data with AI and one large broker said that they will not be using AI for any business purposes anytime soon. ProtectZ's group of under 30s in the industry concluded that AI is unable to tell customers and compliance departments why it's made certain recommendation. And this from people within the industry, which reported in December that trust in the insurance industry has reached a new all-time low. So it's all the more helpful for us to understand what drives trust in AI. We can use trust in AI interchangeably with the term digital trust. To understand what drives digital trust, we need to turn to Daniel Kahneman's description of our two systems of thinking and appreciate how they impact our feelings about sharing data and trust in technology. Our system one brains are lazy and subject to bias. They are responsible for us buying things on the internet, playing online games over and over, scrolling and clicking on social media and doing whatever it is people do on TikTok. Through our system one brains, we're voluntarily giving data to the internet and tech companies that we wouldn't dream of telling a stranger on the street. Our system two, logical, deliberate brains, are the one that we use when making rational decisions. 
when doing online banking and in theory when making insurance decisions. Insurers therefore have to work extra hard to please this more discerning system and are at a disadvantage to the huge tech companies who have established brand trust and are well versed at giving consumers what they want in return for their data. The one-sidedness of data sharing in the insurance industry is a key reason for consumers' lack of digital trust. The Swiss Re Institute identified that the drivers of digital trust are a combination of social, cultural and economic status, and a trust will depend on an individual's own behavioural heuristics and frames of reference. The nine dimensions that influence digital trust fall into three zones, reassurance, security and reliability. For reassurance, keeping a human element of AI helps create trust in the ability of machines to make decisions autonomously. For security, regulations and cybersecurity help users feel safe in exchanging data with other parties. But it's ease of use and accessibility which have the biggest contribution to digital trust. And this is a key area for insurers to focus, creating digital platforms that allow easy functionality, navigation and fine print that's easy to read and understand all positive influence digital trust. Trust in AI lies in understanding how it uses data to reach fair and ethical decisions without compromising human dignity. Explainable AI is created from being able to see the benefits of an intelligent decision-making tool while understanding the mechanisms themselves and believing that AI is free of bias. Explainable AI is what will bridge the gap between the benefits of AI and maintaining trust among policyholders. Insurers can build trust in AI and digital trust generally by providing transparency, understanding and a clear explanation of data requirements while also considering the role of cultural and psychological factors, including 1. Giving back control. Let customers proactively pre-select what data they share with you. 2. Be transparent. Explain when and how data will be used and anonymised. 3. Allow customization. Enable customers to steer their interactions to enforce the perception of control. Four, make it convenient, but not so much that they drift into something they don't want. Allow time for pause and reflection. And five, embed into an ecosystem to develop trust in a wider network and reduce impulsivity in data sharing. The three E's insurers can use to shape digital trust are empowerment, engagement, and emotional connection. At an absolute minimum, insurers must always follow data protection standards and AI governance that's consistent with laws and regulations. Partnerships with the likes of the Veritas Consortium help financial institutions evaluate their AI solutions against the principles of fairness, ethics, accountability and transparency. Don't lose faith. The system that customers use to answer questions about their digital trust is not necessarily the same system they use when making digital decisions. In a 2021 survey, 72% of users said that they trust Facebook not much or not at all. Yet around 2 billion users log onto the platform every day and half a million posts are made every minute. Remember to focus on explainable AI and use whatever tools you have to make sure you really understand your customers and employees to help bring them along your AI journey. Thank you so much, Lizzie, for those wise words on AI. And what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence? Do please put a post on LinkedIn and let us know your views. Use the hashtag ProtectX2024. Now, underwriting is always a topic which stimulates debate about trust in the financial services industry. So to cover this topic, please welcome from HSBC Life, Ed Truman. We need to talk about humanity our protection, trust. In the underwriting world, these are key and integral to what we do every day. So if you, the bottom line for an underwriting team, if you were to break it down to what we essentially do each day, it was we are putting a value or a cost to the customer and saying, this is the cost we think your own morbidity or mortality is worth. Blimey. What a, what a responsibility to have. And it does sound daunting, and it probably is, but it's key, the key, it's the key element of underwriting. And so to take back and take stock of humanity and trust 
are key in what we do. So we, when we look at underwriting, we can't influence how a customer treats their own health, what occupation they take, what residence, where they live, their residency, their travel, all the pastimes they undertake. But what we can do is assess each of those risks correctly with integrity and treat each customer fittingly as an individual human being. So today I'm going to talk about two elements of underwriting and a very key to humanity and trust. One being trust, trust in customers' disclosure. And this has been a key advancement in the 20 plus years I've been in underwriting. When I first started in underwriting, and for many years, an underwriter had to endorse a cus every customer application, regardless of customer age, protection, application, term, clean bill of health. But we've moved on, and correctly, and rightly so. So, and this is really with the advances in technology. So we moved, first of all moved to a simple application process where clean applications where a customer has no disclosures could be accepted at that point of sale through that discussion with their agents and walk away that day or the day of their appointment with, with their policy documents. And now in the current state, we have complex underwriting engines where decision trees and reflexive questions can be built, which really elicit information on really quite serious medical conditions and complex histories and complex pastimes and occupations and all manner of different types of risk. And we can still provide a customer with an application at that point of sale. And that trust in this customer disclosure is a key and, and the basic foundation of an underwriting final decision. And what better way to show trust to a customer by saying, here you go, here's your policy documents on the day of their application. And what's really supported this in this day and age is the public's greater awareness of their own health through wellbeing app apps, wellbeing awareness, NHS apps, different types of medical programs, etc. in the media. And even as myself as an individual, I would say I have a far greater awareness of my own medical history to be able to elicit and discuss that if I was to apply for protection application. And just to put myself in the customer's shoes, I ask myself and my team to look at how we should treat the customer in our assessment of applications and how we build rules to say, okay, you're going to have that discussion with an agent today with about really quite sensitive medical information. And we don't want for you to walk away or a customer or an agent to feel uncomfortable and walk away and think, hold on, I've just basically relayed my life to you, but you don't trust me. We need to get, you need to see medical notes, NHS records about my history. And we're moving away from that, and rightly so, to say, we trust you. We understand your medical conditions, and we're happy to offer you a protection product. So the second thing I'm going to talk about today is non-disclosure. And what is non-disclosure? It's seen as a dirty term, and has given underwriting teams a bad press in the past and current times. But it's a bit of a red herring because underwriting teams are really conducting post-issue sample checks on customers' NHS records. And these checks aren't to catch a customer out, it's not to catch an agent out, it's to ensure that as insurers, we are conducting ourselves correctly. Our application journeys are concise, our application questions are simple, without complex terminology. So com customers have confidence in what they are disclosing. So then they have confidence in their product when they make a claim. If we find an inconsistency in a customer's NHS record against their application form, we don't say a customer's non-disclosed. We don't say a customer's been fraudulent. We try to understand these inconsistencies. And that would be through directly conversing with a customer. 
And from those interactions with customers, we will then seek to give the customer a decision on what we feel is the correct approach. And this decision will be to try and keep the customer's protection product. We're not out to remove cover. We are trying to understand why customers, NHS records and application disclosures have inconsistencies. We are actively looking to maintain cover and converse with customers to ensure that when we maintain cover, they have confidence in the event of a claim with their protection policy. So today we've talked about non-disclosure, talked about trust in customers, which are integral for an underwriting team and their service to customers. Thank you so much for those thought provoking points on underwriting, Ed. Our next speaker comes to us from the Warwick Business School. Please welcome to the ProtectX virtual stage, Dr. Kasper Kaiser. We need to talk about money. To do so, it may be best to step back for a moment and look at the very long run of the history of humanity. What is the one thing that we're really good at and keep getting better at it? Well, it's making money. Here's a picture of the level of global gross domestic product, GDP, per capita over the last 2000 years. It is a remarkable picture. Here's a thing, possibly the only thing, at least I cannot think of any other example, where we've become literally exponentially better over at least the last 200 years. Crucially, this trend, as depicted here, does not show any sign of stopping in the last 40 years. Economists in particular should rejoice. After all, for them, it is often axiomatic, that is a self-evident truth, that greater incomes imply better lives. But is that true? Well, here's another picture. It shows the level of self-reported life satisfaction on a zero to 10 scale over the last 40 years across more than 100 countries. These lines are practically flat and replicable across many other data sets. And this is despite enormous economic growth over this period. Why might this be? After all, our individual incomes are a key determinant of our well-being. To show this, here's a picture from a current project of mine, where ultimately I analyze the relationship between income inequality and well-being, but that's a story for another time. The picture shows, simply put, the relationship between individuals' well-being, as again measured by self-reported life satisfaction, and people's disposable household incomes. This data is very reliable. It comes from a set of surveys collected on behalf of the European Commission from about 750,000 individuals across 32 European countries. We clearly see that unless you are part of the top 5% of the income distribution, i.e. those above roughly 70,000 euros annually, changes in our income can have a drastic impact on how we feel about our own lives. I would imagine that many of the audience are not part of this group. Maybe this also ought to give us pause to ponder. In any event, we are now presented with a puzzle. We know that economic output and income have been increasing over the last 40 years. We also know that incomes matter heavily for our well-being. And yet, when we look at changes in well-being over long periods of time, people's subjective quality of life seems to have failed to improve. This is troubling and in some sense disappointing. Wouldn't it be amazing if the one thing we are good at would also be good for us? Again, why might this be? There are many potential answers to this question. Maybe the benefits of income are only relative. My satisfaction with life might increase when I'm richer than you, but not when we both become richer by the same amount. This is plausible, and I've done research in this direction. But again, this is a story for another time. Instead, I want to suggest another story. Losses loom larger than gains. Imagine I offer you a pay rise of an additional £20,000 annually. You will likely be somewhat happier. But now, I imagine that I cut your salary by the same £20,000. 
this will likely cause some distress in you. You will be much less happy. This asymmetry has long been documented at the individual level. However, more recently, George Ward and Yanni Manuel Deneev at Oxford and other colleagues have shown that the same asymmetry also holds at the level of entire countries. As shown in these pictures for a global sample, as well as samples for, the, for Europe and the US in particular, the negative effects of a recession are roughly two to five times larger than the positive effects of economic growth. Of course, most years we experience economic growth. Only every 10 years or so do we experience a recession, unless of course you live in the UK, where I find myself currently. What does this imply? It turns out that this kind of asymmetry can explain the puzzle we started with. This picture here shows this in a very stylized way. On the horizontal axis, we see time. And on the two vertical axis, we see changes in the levels of well-being in GDP per capita. Suppose that in the first 10 years, we live through annual growth of 2%. On average, we become mildly happier with each passing gain. But then a recession hits. The economy contracts by 4%. Because the effect of a recession is five times larger, our well-being drops to the level of 10 years ago. Nevertheless, despite the, re the recession, we are still somewhat richer than 10 years ago. We are richer, but equally happy. Not a great outcome. Now imagine that as we go further in time, this boom and bust cycle keeps repeating. In that case, as illustrated in this picture, we should see sustained economic growth without any sustained increases in our well-being. I believe that this is a rather plausible story about the world we currently find ourselves in. What is the upshot then? I think there are four lessons. First, at the level of entire economies, we need to find a way to make economic growth more stable. In the end, a slightly lower rate, but one without recessions, will pay off for all of us. Second. If the interest is in workplace well-being, at the level of individual businesses, we ought to make pay scales predictable, with smooth upwards growth paths and, where possible, less variable performance-related pay. Third, at the level of our own individual lives, the evidence shows that we are poor effective forecasters. We tend not to be aware of the consequences of our choices on our own emotional lives. Therefore, when we make decisions about the career paths we pursue, or the investment decisions we take, or indeed encourage others to pursue, we should be more aware and make a conscious effort towards building such awareness of this asymmetry between gains and losses. Many of you will be comparatively high-performing and relatively risk-tolerant individuals. This kind of take may therefore be uncomfortable or counterintuitive. But I do hope that there's some particular value in uncomfortable and counterintuitive takes. Finally, as a fourth upshot, societal loss aversion does not only apply to money. The same reasoning holds with respect to our physical health and to our social relationships. And societal loss aversion does not occur in a vacuum. We therefore have a responsibility for each other to protect each other from loss, whether that's financial or otherwise and thereby build our collective trust that the future will, hopefully, be a brighter one. Thank you so much for that presentation, Casper. And now we come to the advisor perspective. Crystal Skelton works for Cura, and Crystal was also the winner of the Protection Review Individual Intermediary Awards from 2023. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Crystal Skelton. We need to talk about underwriting and claims, the start and end of any protection journey. For many people, underwriting is as simple as answering a few health and lifestyle questions and cover is provided. But for others, additional medical underwriting is required. For any clients that approach us who may have medical conditions, the best thing that we can do as advisors is to speak to the insurers and look at who may be able to offer the best terms. In turn, we can go back to our clients and give them a fairly accurate indication of what terms may be offered to them once underwriting is completed. Additional underwriting could be a report from the GP, a telephone interview with the insurer 
or a nurse medical screening. All of these could be stressful for a client and we need to do all that we can to prepare our clients for this and give them as much information as possible to make the situation as easy as we can. We're seeing a lot of underwriting at Cura. It's what we do. One of the areas that we have seen an increase in recently is mental health. Mental health is a huge area and absolutely a sliding scale with major extremes. Some people have suffered with mental health for many years. It's been very serious and they've got the help and support that they needed. The other end of the scale are clients that don't actually suffer with mental health, but have support services available by their employer or potentially through the protection that we've arranged for them, they have decided that they would look into and use these services. One of my clients has recently done this through a support service that they have from their employer. They were diagnosed with a long-standing medical condition when they were quite young. And although they do not suffer with their mental health in any way, they had access to this service and thought, why don't I use this just to talk through what impact that medical condition has had on my life and how I have dealt with this and if I can deal with it in any way better than how I am. As such, they access that support through their employer, were provided with 20 counselling sessions, which is standard for the service that was provided. But due to this, when we've done an income protection application, cover was turned down due to the cumulative effect of the other medical conditions that were in place. The client was classed as suffering with their mental health. The client was not suffering with their mental health. They had accessed a support service that we actually provide as an industry, as a benefit, and that was used against them. Is this the right thing? The other end of the scale in the protection journey is claims. Arguably, the whole reason why we arrange protection in the first place. For most people, this is going to be one of the most stressful times in their life. They're either very unwell or potentially being given a terminal diagnosis. It's the responsibility of both the advisor and the insurer to help these clients as quickly and as smoothly as possible to ensure that a claim is paid we have had instances recently where clients have contacted us and advised that they need to make a claim. We've helped and supported them with that and we've contacted the insurer to advise them of the situation. We have then contacted the client and let them know that the insurer will be in touch for any additional information that they may need as part of that claim. And we have advised that we will help and support them in any way that we can. When we have then contacted the insurer, a week or so later to ask where the claims process is, we've been told by the claims handler that they are not able to discuss the client's case with us due to data protection. Even with signed consent from the client, some insurers will still not speak to advisors when a claim is taking place. Even when we are the ones who have advised them of that, and actually provided them with all of the client's medical information in the first place. Is this right? And does this help the industry to create trust and show that we work together? Another area of claims that I'd like to talk about are claim statistics. Every insurer now produces claim statistics, which is great. We can see where we are, we can see what insurers are doing very well at, and areas that there could potentially be improvement for. The issue with claim statistics are they're not standardised. This means that insurer one may be advising of X, Y and Z within their claim statistics and insurer two may be including A, B and C. This means that claim statistics potentially are not accurate they're not comparable and we can't look at them and break down and go, they're doing very well in this and they are doing very well in that. Should claim statistics now be standardised? Should all insurers have to follow a set guideline of what is included within their claim statistics? 
For example, some insurers do not include terminal illness claims that are turned down within their claim statistics. That is going to be a claim at some point. The client has been advised that they are terminally ill, but because it does not fit within the 12 months left to live that most insurers stipulate as part of a terminal illness claim, then claim is turned down at that time. But as we say, that will be a claim at some point. Should that then be included within the claim statistics? In conclusion, we all need to be working together insurers, clients and advisors alike to ensure that we are speaking to clients as individuals, not as a general overview of their health and their conditions. And we need to be more transparent about the information that we are putting out as an industry to ensure that trust can be harboured against the general public and us as an industry. Well, there's lots for us to think about there. Thank you so much for that presentation, Crystal. Now we're going to turn to critical illness cover, and arguably critical illness cover has been the protection success story of the last three decades. But what do consumers think of critical illness cover? Do they trust it? Do they even really actually understand it? To address these issues, please welcome from CI expert, Paul Roberts. We need to talk about trust, and in particular, we need to talk Uberima Fides. So what exactly is that? Uberima Fides is a Latin phrase which means in utmost good faith. Today, all contracts are issued on the basis of good faith, but with an insurance, life insurance in particular, the stronger in utmost good faith applies. So in other words, the insurer trusts the person or persons taking out the life critical illness and or income protection cover to tell them the truth about themselves, the reason they want the cover and for how long they want that cover for, so the correct insurance risk can be placed upon them and they must do that uberima fides. So trust is the principal doctrine that governs all insurance contracts. There must be insurable interest and a material loss. So all parties to an insurance contract, whether that's the person taking out the cover, the advisor involved if there is one, if there's not an advisor, then the supplier of the information being used by the buyer to make a decision, the insurers involved, and more recently, the various research platforms used by advisors must all deal in utmost good faith. So now that we've established trust as the underlying principle of every insurance policy, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes looking in a bit more depth at two areas where trust plays an integral role in the protection industry of today. Firstly, trust in the advice process. When I joined the Guardian Royal Exchange in Cardiff in 1986, life cover had been around for over 2,000 years. The first life insurance policy in England dates back to the 18th of June 1583. Income protection dates back to industrial Britain during the late 1800s, but in 1986, critical illness was in its infancy. Critical illness plans then meandered along for a while, paying the full amount of cover only for a claim on a relatively small number of conditions, especially compared to today, and when that claim was paid, that plan would stop. This all changes on the 3rd of July 2003, when something a bit radical happened. Scandia were the first insurer to introduce additional payments for low-grade breast and prostate cancer. These additional payments paid the lower of £10,000 or 25% of the cover level at the time. But if the claim on those two conditions was paid, the main plan itself continued. That small change started the great CI conditions race, which over the next 20 years or so, dramatically changed critical illness products beyond recognition. For the first 26 years or so after the launch of critical illness, financial advisors were basically left to themselves, expected to research and understand the differences between products, constantly keep themselves up to date as more and more insurers entered the market and more and more conditions were added, without any real medical knowledge or experience of epidemiology. And that process, even if it were possible, would take many, many hours, even days, 
without any guarantee that the advice given would result in a sale. It wasn't until 2012 that the first critical illness comparison site became available. Today, the role of the independent research platform has never been in so important, and with advisors having more tech available to support them than ever before, the trust in these platforms is equally important. The more recent changes, such as improvements to children's cover, makes it almost unrecognisable whether it's automatically included or optional. It can now even be added to adult life only and income protection plans. Serious illness plans can have many more conditions than the critical illness plan, albeit at different severity levels, while this doesn't start to take into account the huge diversity in added value services and additional cost benefits available today. And this has only increased the importance of the research platform. The good news for everybody is this research and much, much more can now be done in a matter of a few seconds. This independent qualitative analysis is supported by interactive and visually engaging tools that are designed to help consumers have a greater understanding and therefore trust in the products that they are buying. We've trusted the individual to tell the truth about themselves and the advice process is supported by research platforms that the advisors use to make their recommendations on. But are we still missing a crucial element in this circle of trust? I think we are. And I think that element that we are missing is the trust in the consumers of the protection plans of today. And it's taken CI Experts Critical Thinking 2024 report to highlight what those findings are. So what did Critical Thinking 24 tell us about trust? One of the most disappointing findings in Critical Thinking 2024 is the apparent lack of trust consumers have in the advice process itself. 28% of the 5,000 consumers surveyed saying they didn't want to be pressurised into buying something. 17% of them didn't trust advisors at all. 15% didn't think advisors added any value. With more women than men having concerns about being pressurised or believe they can't afford advice. All this time, the industry has made assumptions on behalf of its consumers that we know what's best for them. With 57% of advisors surveyed saying one in four of their clients were completely unaware of critical illness. The insights contained within the critical thinking report has demonstrated very clear proof that critical illness cover suffers from an identity crisis. Misunderstood, undersold, and underbought. So what do we need to do next? We need to talk about trust with our consumers, our clients, our policyholders, the everyday person who wants to protect themselves, their families and their businesses. Trust them to tell us about the products they want for the future, what benefits they'd like included, the added value services they'd like to access, how they'd like to be kept informed of the benefits they have and how they'd like to buy them in the future. It's not for us in the industry to make those decisions for them. It's the trust we have in our consumers that will help us all inspire the innovation and protection products they need. And without that trust in the consumers of today, we will all fail to give them trust in the protection plans of tomorrow. Thank you so much for that presentation, Paul. And finally, we're going to talk about language. And let's be honest, when it comes to trust, language in the financial services industry is very, very important. Complex language and gobbledygook doesn't inspire trust. Simple language does. And Quiet Room have been at the forefront of helping businesses work towards simplifying their communications and simplifying their language. So we're delighted that our final speaker today is from Quiet Room. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Rhys Williams. We need to talk about stories. Let me tell you one about me. Uh, I love the Olympics. I have loved the Olympics since I saw Daley Thompson win decathlon gold in LA in 1984. Just to be clear, he was in LA, I was in a caravan in West Wales. But anyway, 
I love the Olympics. So when the Olympics came to London in 2012, I was desperate to get tickets. Uh, I wanted to see the 100 metres final. I wanted to see Usain Bolt cross the line. Turns out quite a few other people wanted that too. So I ended up with tickets to the weightlifting. The weightlifting was at the Excel in London. I went with my friend Dom. I met him in a bar about 100 metres away for lunch before we went into the weightlifting. It was a beautiful day, blazing sunshine. We sat outside. Dom went into the bar to get a drink, came back, two drinks in his hand, a grin all over his face, and he said to me, do you know what I really love about the Olympics? It's that people go completely mad for sports they know nothing about, would not watch in the intervening four years between Olympics, and yet suddenly they get incredibly excited about because there's a British person competing. I said, what makes you say that? He said, well, it's in there, there's about 50 people going nuts for women's judo. A little while later, I go into the bar to get a drink and I take a look at the crowd of people that Don was talking about. And when I look a bit closer, I realise they've all got matching T-shirts on. And on the front of those T-shirts is the face of the woman competing in the bronze medal bout on the big screen. Wow, I think. They're her friends and her family and her supporters. And they couldn't get tickets to go and see her, but they've traveled to London anyway to watch it in a pub a hundred meters away from where it's happening. And isn't that amazing? Just as I think this, there's a massive roar and they all start jumping up and down and hugging each other. She's won. There's tears, there's a girl on the phone to her mum saying, I can't believe she's done it. So I go out to Dom and say, do you know the reason they were getting so excited is they know her? wonder who she is. So I get my phone out and I Google her and I find she's called Karina Bryant. She's actually a bit of a judo legend. She's competed in four Olympics uh, leading up to 2012 and never won anything. She's had a really tough journey to these Olympics. So she uh, had to crowdfund £5,000 to buy a car just so she could get to training. Um, she had a horrible neck injury. She didn't think she was going to make it, but she trained hard. She got there. She competed and she won. What's the point of this story? 10,768 athletes competed in those games. Every one of them had family and friends and supporters behind them, just like Karina Bryant did. Every one of them had a story. Let me tell you another story. Um, this time it's even more personal. Um, bear with me because I'm about to take a rather sudden handbrake turn. Um, because I want to talk about school attendance. Uh, the obvious next place to go after women's judo. I'm sure you'd agree. Uh, so you may know there's a school attendance crisis. You've probably seen, seen it on the news. One in four children are classed as persistently absent. So that figure was one in nine before the pandemic. Persistently absent means you miss 10% of school sessions. So there are two school sessions in a day. So that means that you are missing a morning or an afternoon a week. So there's a morning or an afternoon a week when you're not at school. Um, if you miss 50% of school sessions, so half the week, um, you're classed as severely absent. There's no official term for kids who barely get there at all, but the media has a name for them. Uh, it's not very nice. They call them ghost children. I don't like this term. I find it upsetting. But let me tell you why. My 14 year old son has only been to school for six days in this academic year and probably only 10 days in the last 18 months. He's been physically ill, frequent severe migraines. He's been mentally ill, problems sleeping, problems eating, problems leaving the house. He's very likely to have some form of undiagnosed neurodiversity probably autism. It's had a massive impact on our family. Um, I've had time off work because of the strain it's put me under. My wife has had to leave her job because her employer refused to adjust her hours to allow her to support our son. As you can gather, my son has lots of problems, but he's not a ghost. 
he's a living, breathing boy. You can't hope to understand him or us or our predicament if you bury his story inside a big number or an unhelpful metaphor. We applied for an EHCP, an education, health and care plan for him two days ago. The, the Senko at the school told us that she was putting in 10 EHCP applications that day. So that's 10 applications in one day from one school. There are 15 secondary schools in our borough. There are 32 boroughs in London. There are 317 local authorities in England, 426 in the UK. You get the message. Every time the numbers get bigger, the impact gets smaller. Yes, you can see the scale of the problem. That's powerful. Yes, you can start to see patterns in the data. That's helpful. But you can't see the children's faces anymore. We've lost the story. Today's about the humanity of protection. Um, I have to admit, I find conversations about how we can make the protection industry more human a little silly. Um, what we do is inherently human. We help people in their darkest hours. Behind every life insurance claim there's a bereavement. There's somebody's husband or wife or mum or dad that's not there anymore. Behind every critical illness claim, there's a moment in a doctor's surgery when someone hears words that seem to stop the world. Behind every policy, there's a person. Behind every person, there's a life. And our lives are made up of experiences, memories, moments. And the way that we give meaning to all of that is stories. So if you want someone to care, care enough to search online for life insurance or call you up about income protection, care enough to keep a critical illness policy that they're thinking of cancelling, care enough to write a good news story about our industry when they were thinking of slanging us off, the numbers are not going to be enough, no matter how big they are. What you need is stories. My goodness, wasn't Reese's presentation emotional? What an emotional way to complete our seven talks today. I have to say the first time I saw that, I did have tears in my eyes. Well done, Reese. Welcome to the live studio. I'm delighted to introduce our guests today. Claire Bostock from HSBC and Emma Vaughan from Simply, Vi Simply Biz. Would you like to just introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do and maybe give us a, an unknown fact about yourselves, Claire? Uh, so, um, thank you Roger. Uh, Claire Bostock, I am a Senior Business Development Manager for HSBC Life. Um, I've been with HSBC about six years now, but in the industry quite a long time, um, about 25 years, so it's showing uh, my uh, advancing years there. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of experience within the financial services market. Um, I was a mortgage advisor for 10 years, um, I've been a call centre manager, uh, and I think, yeah, business development the last 10 years. So um, yeah, lots of uh, uh, experience uh, within the, the financial services um, market. Um, a little no an unknown fact about myself. Um, well, I can tell you actually that I was um, a bit of a child star actually. Um, <laughs> I was big in the 80s in the pantomime world. Um, uh, I was on stage uh, for a whole pantomime season with um, some uh, legends such as uh, Les Dawson. Oh. So, <laughs> you know, if you would like an autograph afterwards, that's fine. But yeah, a little known fact. Can was... you do that thing where you used to play the piano out of tune? I mean, you have to be you have to be able to play the piano perfectly to be able to, to play be able it out to do of that. tune. Yeah, no, he was a legend, absolutely. <laughs> Emma, how about yourself? Uh, Emma Vaughan, I'm head of protection and health services at Simply Biz. Like Claire, I've been around a long time as well. So I've been in the protection industry for nearing twenty 
20 years now. Um, before moving to a service provider, Simply Biz, I did my rounds uh, around a couple of different insurers, started off my um, long-term protection career at Legal in General, stinted the Exeter and British Friendly as well, um, but I actually started my financial services career at HSBC, so uh, we've come full circle <laughs> there. Um, little known fact of myself, I had everybody giggling at this at Christmas time because it's a running joke, if you're from Wales you're meant to be able to sing obviously, <laughs> that isn't my forte, but I can play the violin. Wow, oh, oh impressive. Fantastic, <laughs> and of, despite the Welsh accent, um, Emma does actually live in Edinburgh as well as I do, so we've both travelled all the way down from Scotland to be here for Protect X8. So, Shep Hyken, what a start. It was rapid fire, wasn't it? Yeah. Seven ideas in seven minutes. I did think, how is he going to cram all of this into those seven minutes? But I think he did touch on quite a few really important things when it comes to customer service. And one of the things that really stuck out for me, Claire, was this statement he made about we should meet customer expectations every time. Mm -hmm. And it did make me wonder, how do we know what those expectations are? Do we set them yeah. or do we assume? What do you think about about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love Shep's video, so, so full of energy, um, as you say. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, it's looking at customer insight, really, and ensuring that we understand in the first instance what those customer expectations are, because if we don't, then how can we possibly meet them? Um, but it's also about transparency as well, um, making sure that customers uh, are aware um, of timescales and that you are promising them, um, uh, you are delivering them what you are actually promising them. So transparency, communication, um, but also um, having a, a form of contact, perhaps when things don't go as smoothly as a customer might expect to have that um, that telephone number you can pick up the phone to I think from a BDM perspective as well from uh, its advisors really that are our customers ultimately um, and just ma making sure that um, we do have that um, level of communication and they know where to find us when when they need us mm. and Emma I think since the pandemic it's probably been fair to say that service levels in the financial services industry, in, in fact in any industry, haven't been quite as, as good as they used to be. And perhaps there's a bit of concern amongst advisors that service levels are pretty low, mm. maybe especially when it comes to claims. Mm. And we know that the claim is probably the most important thing mm. that we do. It's our product, as somebody very famously said once. How do we turn this round? both from the advisor's point of view and from the product provider's point of view? I think there's a couple of things. I think, as, as we've talked about there, setting an expectation. It's helping a customer understand what we're used to seeing in terms of service levels in the industry because you know we may as we've all been around a long time we can remember service levels being extremely good we can remember them being extremely bad as well so it's not about setting a level that is unachievable for a provider if we already understand that they're not at the level like we talked about pre-pandemic the reality of it is it's just making sure when you are speaking to customers they know what time scales you're working to all providers have service levels so you know and the more more, the majority, I should say, will stick to them. So I think it's just about having realistic expectations for customers as well. I think we talk about claims all the time, um, and I get when customers are wanting to make claims, they expect the money to be in their bank account straight away. But again, it's just about understanding that process and what we can do as advisors, providers, and customers, and then working with GPs, consultants, to make sure that information comes back in in a timely manner. And I think ultimately, for me, one of the points that Shep touched on about delivering customer service and how you put yourself in the very best light and, and garner that trust from a customer is knowledge and I think that was the biggest thing that resonated with me and I guess again my background you know was a BDM for a long time you know senior BDM like Claire is the, the way I found it easier to work with customers was if I knew my stuff and I'm not just talking like product and proposition it's understanding your customer as well so you talked about advisors are your customers it's the same for us in the service provider world our members are technically our customers it's about understanding what they want what they need and when they need it and be able to deliver that and it's not always about delivering a good message either 
being able to trust somebody means you can deliver good, yeah. bad or indifferent messages, but it's the truth mm -hmm. and it's upfront and it just means then they will believe what you say going forward and that they can rely on you. Good. I love the way that you honed in on knowledge there from uh, as one of Shep's seven points. I mean, knowledge is, is, is so important. And I guess all of his seven points revolved around human interaction, didn't yeah. they? And then in the next talk, we had Lizzie talking about AI. Now, let's face it, AI is, um, well, lots of people have different views of AI. On the one hand, people might think, actually, do you know what? AI is really just sophisticated computer software. We're just calling it AI now. And then, of course, you get the doom mongers at the other end of the scale saying it's Skynet and Terminators and, and, and the end of the world. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is interesting to think how we will use AI maybe to replace some of that human touch and whether that's a good idea or not. And Emma, I just wondered from your point of view, where, where do you think we are with AI in the industry now, truthfully? If, if, if to, to give my honest opinion on it, I think we are using the term AI in the protection industry, but we are nowhere near actual AI, if I'm honest. So we have fantastic systems in the market. Um, we'll obviously come on to talk about a couple as we go, you know, talk through the different sessions we've had this morning. But ultimately, what's there now is process software and systems that are there to drive efficacies for advisors and make the systems and the processes a lot easier. I've done quite a few sessions on AI. Obviously, we're simply busy being a fintech company. And realistically, when we're talking to the, you know, the everyday financial advisor, whether that's a, a holistic advisor, protection only, mortgage and protection, AI is not factoring in their day-to-day -day businesses. It really isn't. You know, um, I've worked with providers as well who are starting to bring AI into the, you know, in the back office systems and how they are utilising it, especially for things like underwriting and claims. And that's where it's being utilised. But it really, we haven't got... To grips with it, advisor facing yet. If I'm and again being entirely honest, when it comes to some of the tech that we have in the market, we've got lots of different CRM tools, we've got research tools, we've got everything out there. We haven't even got that in a joined up approach at the moment. So I think we need to take a step back actually and really take advisors on a journey of what's out there, what can be used, how it can be used, and what kind of tech stacks would drive efficiencies in a business. Because we've been in this race in the last couple of years to get to a point where we can say, all right, ultimately the only bit of the advice process you need to do is sit down with a customer and advise them that we've, we've just leaped ahead. So I think we literally need to go back to basics, have a look what we've got in the market, is it fit for purpose? And how do we start to get more advisors using those bits that are out there before we even consider robots taking over an advice <laughs> process? And I think that um, when it comes to service, there's always that fear that if we introduce something like an AI into our customer service mm. processes, we are effectively putting the human being one step away from the customer if we put some sort of AI between them, whether it's a chat bot or whether it's a, a telephone IVR. In fact, when I think about a telephone IVR, I always think about uh, when we first introduced call centres, that must be two decades mm -hmm. ago, everybody offshored their um, call centres yeah. to India or the Caribbean or wherever it was. And to a certain extent, that was all about cost cutting. It was so much cheaper to do it off offshore and unfortunately service levels suffered as a result mm -hmm. and then it all came around and we started to onshore the, um, the, the call centres again to improve the service. Are we in danger do you think of repeating that mistake with AI and, and from a product provider's point of view what would you be doing at HSBC to ensure that even the human isn't going to be taken out of the equation completely. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, when I look back 25 years ago, when I was a mortgage advisor, I used to get a fax through that would tell me where I was going that day. Um, and uh, I had to fax back with the, the results of the, the day's appointments. Um, and when they changed that, we had to start inputting them into a, a system. And it was all, oh, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. And it's too much hassle, etc. But 25 years on obviously the world has changed so much where we are now and the way that we use tech 
who's to say what will happen in 20 years time um, as, as far as AI goes and how that can enhance people's um, journey and, and make things more streamlined. But I think that's the important thing. As long as it's about making journeys more customer centric, more streamlined, making a better um, process for an advisor um, uh, as an enhancement rather than replacing the human element, um, I think then it can only be a positive thing um, providing that human element remains. Yeah, I think I heard somebody describe it that we should always consider AI to be a tool, hmm. a tool that humans use rather than something that replaces human. Yeah. And if we always keep that in mind, mm -hmm. then ideally that should mean that the human touch remains. Yeah. But we'll have to remain to see whether Skynet really does <laughs> take over the world and we need Arnold to come in and, uh, and help, help rescue us. I think that um, when it comes to customer service, underwriting is probably one of those areas that creates the most emotion mm. amongst advisors and amongst customers when they talk about the insurance process, possibly because it takes a long time, possibly because there's delays, and possibly because there will ultimately be a bit of disappointment if there's a rating or a decline. Uh, it was really interesting, again, to hear Ed talk about the the process and how they and how you really do try to make it feel human but what 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 are your views on underwriting at the moment Claire and whether it can ever truly be customer facing given the fact that ultimately we might end up disappointing somebody um well gosh uh, underwriting um is uh, a, a very difficult process, um, uh, and you know there's an, a huge amount of resource that go, it goes into ensuring that um, the, the process is as streamlined as possible from an, a customer perspective and an advisor perspective. Um, so um, yeah, a absolutely, the, there's a place for technology there, but we're always going to be need that um, that human um, touch um, to, um, to to back those processes up. Um, so so yeah. Um, there's all sorts of pre-underwriting tools now that people can use um, to ensure um, that they don't get that the time isn't wasted. Um, uh, that there's uh, portals that can be used, uh, such as Underwrite Me, um, which which uh, assists greatly in underwriting as well. So there are options and the tools are there, but it's just to ensure that um, advisors are using them actually. Yeah, and and Emma, from an advisor's point of view, again, there will be frustrations with the underwriting process, um, but. What can advisors do more with, the, with your clients to make them understand the process and to perhaps make them trust it more? I think it's transparency more mm -hmm. than anything. Um, I think we've got to a place right now in 2024 where we've got different demographics of advisors who look at different ways and how to engage with customers, which is fantastic because it just means obviously we're getting out there and speaking to more customers. But I think what we've done along the way is probably lost a bit of the how we gather information for customers and the time that it takes to gather the information to talk through the process. So, you know, you'll have telephone models, you'll have completely online models, you'll have traditional advisors who sit in front of a customer and therefore going through an application journey can potentially be different for every customer. And back to that, that customer service that they get to go through it and therefore their experience of it can be different. So somebody running through a question set which could take 20 minutes for one advisor or an advisor will sit for an hour and a half and go through it to fully understand the ins and outs of that customer's fact find, you know, their medical conditions, even, you know, where they work, how they work, absolutely everything about their lifestyle. And I think we've probably gone a bit too far in the sense of we're trying to make it as quick as possible, but we want customers to understand the value of what they're taking out because we want them to get a claim at the back end. So being open and honest and transparent with your advisor means that you are in the best possible situation to get a claim on the back end. And I think, again, that's something that needs to be brought back in is taking the time with the customer rather than it being a one and done and over in 30 minutes it's do they need an hour to go through it do they need an hour and a half to go through it what does that customer need for them to fully understand and appreciate the underwriting and then again back to what we said about if it's going to take one week two week are they going to need to write out for a gp report it's transparency from top down so the provider explaining what they will need how long that's likely to take 
and explaining that to the customer so they know exactly what kind of journey they're in for. Mm-hmm. And I think we, um, we obviously have so much data these days when it comes to underwriting. And an underwriting is risk assessment, isn't it? It's risk yeah. assessment. But maybe there's also that feeling that we're tr- we obviously have to find um, if anybody's non-disclosing mm. or, it, or, or they're not telling the truth. But we shouldn't be assuming that that's going to happen. Yeah. And is, is, is there still that perception, do you think, Claire, that underwriting is about trying to trip people up? And that doesn't help with trust, does it? And now I know that that's not the situation, yeah. but it is a, held, a commonly held belief. Yeah. So what do we do about that? Well, uh, it's really interesting, actually, because I have listened to a lot of non-disclosure calls um, as uh, for compliance purposes um, and training purposes. Um, and the, um, the recurring theme throughout those call listening exercises is always the time that the advisor takes with the customer. Mm-hmm. Going back to what you were saying uh, a moment ago, Emma, it's just so, so important. Um, uh, some some advisors will insist on doing um, the process on a, a, a two call basis, um, and I have to say, having listened to the calls, the um, the non disclosure rates on on two call um, sales are um, much less purely because of the time that the customers had to think about the answers. I think very experienced advisors sometimes can fall into the trap of um, they, they know the criteria, they know what question's coming next, and they can almost lead a customer down with a certain answer, not intentionally, and uh, I think that's very much um, the point, it's not intentional, but when you're not giving um, yourself as an advisor time to speak and the customer time to think, um, then that is when these issues tend to arise. So I think taking that time is, is absolutely be crucial and from a retention perspective as well cases where uh, the, the advisor has taken that additional time and um, you really do see the results when it comes to um, uh, positive um, CFI and lapse rates as well. So one end of the um, process we have the underwriting and yep. the policies in force for however many years and eventually a claim might take place. I was really quite taken with um, Crystal's story mm. about somebody who'd been making use of a, an added value service and that became an issue during the underwriting process. Yeah. What was your take on that, Claire? Yeah, um, it was. Uh, I can completely understand um, Crystal's frustration uh, and the uh, the customer's frustration as well in circumstances like that. Um, going back to what I was saying before about the pre-underwriting tools, I think that is so, so important um, to ensure that the advisor has done the research um, to, to make sure that um, there, there isn't a, an insurer out there that perhaps could offer terms. Um, insurers are constantly evolving. We constantly evolving with our um, uh, our underwriting stance um, so advisors don't necessarily know what the, the, the latest outcome might be of putting that application through so I would say I'm not I'm not saying that Crystal didn't do the um, the research in this instance but as a whole doing that research and making sure that you are placing the customer with um, the right provider for them based on time scales um, uh, and product as well um, is really really important. And I, and I suppose there's, a, there's a, a massive amount of trust placed on the customer, to be honest, during the underwriting process and the application process. And it, it did make me laugh that Paul Roberts used the phrase Uberima Fides. I mean, who <laughs> even remembers U- Uberima Fides? I don't think I've heard Uberima Fides since I did at the CII exams, probably 25 or maybe even 30 years ago. But it, it, it is a... It was a salutary reminder, wasn't it, from Paul about that. Um, and, and in an earlier version of his um, presentation, that he did talk a little bit more about the history of utmost good faith. He mm. mentioned the Gambling Act from 1774, when before which you could take out a life insurance policy on anybody. It was almost like a, a, a bet, a gamble. Um, but it was all about trust, and it, and it, and it, it is interesting. I, I do wonder whether people who are coming into the industry now would even know the history of things like Absolutely. 1774 and Uberima Fides. But sticking with Paul Roberts, obviously very passionate advocate for critical illness cover yeah. and CI experts research that came out recently was, was highlighted quite a few interesting things again about customer understanding Mm -hmm. of the criticals or maybe customers lack of understanding of the the product and Emma I'd be really interested in in your 
um, thoughts on this from the advisor's point of view. We still have a conditions race. Mm. Perhaps it's not quite as intense as it used to be, although you could perhaps argue that the conditions race has been replaced with the added value services race. But to a certain extent, it's all about competition, isn't it? Mm. And uh, as pro product providers, the, the view will be, if one company has X number of conditions, yep. X number of partial payments, whatever it might be, an advisor isn't going to recommend us if we have less. Mm. So we're almost locked into a sort of catch-22 situation where we sort of have to keep doing it. And we have to look good on mm. things like CI Expert, mm -hmm. otherwise advisors aren't going to use us. So how do we break out of this trap? Because we seem to be almost stuck in the catch-22 situation. It's a really difficult one that we have actually created for ourselves, you know, even going back to when I started in the industry 20 years ago at Legal in General, and they were always, you know, I think it was something, we've got 52 illnesses, and then somebody came out with 55, and then Vitality came in with their 168, I think it was, at one point. And, yeah, we've made a rod for our own back, but what we've done is we've lost in translation the products that are out there and then that understanding translating that to the customers. One of the um, interesting facts that came out from the critical thinking um, report from CI Expert was what customers are actually spending the money on when a critical illness policy is paid out and the highest scoring thing on there was um, to pay for advanced medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know that's private medical. And then the second one down was to take time off work to recover, which we all know is income protection. So I think what's happened is all these illnesses are going up and up and up. As, as you know, Roger, I agree, we've pivoted now when we're on the ancillary benefits race and everything's getting a little bit diluted and therefore advisors don't know exactly what's in the market because there's so much in the market. And then they're relying on research tools, which have a place. We've talked about technology. They definitely have a place to support suitability and why you've gone down that route. But what we can't do is detract from what you know as an advisor. That's down to providers to show advisors what you need to be. But in terms of scaling back, there hasn't been any real innovation in the market in, I would say, a long time in terms of scaling things right back. Again, we all know the figures, top four, five illnesses that are claimed on make up for over 90% of all claims. I think AIG tried a couple of years ago with their scaled back um, critical illness and only having a set amount of illnesses. That didn't take off as well as either. So for me, I think it's maybe a case of everybody getting back around the table and saying, what are customers looking for? Because I think we've gone off in a direction where we think they want 168 critical illness definitions. Mm -hmm. When when I was at Legal in General was removal of an eyeball, which yeah. I thought was <laughs> ludicrous. Um, but the reality of it is, are customers claiming on these things? No, they're not. Mm -hmm. What do they want? And I think reports like critical thinking, they are key to finding out what consumers actually want so we can actually go in the right direction. And yeah. what do you think from a product provider's um, perspective, Claire? Um, well, it's not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to protection, and um, we uh, we do share with advisors um, uh, the benefits a lot of the time of um, a portfolio of, of, of cover from different providers. We have an incredibly strong um, critical illness plan, uh, one of the strongest in the marketplace, um, but that's not saying that there aren't elements out of other providers' um, proposition that really, really complement our, uh, uh, our own products. So um, yeah, I think it's not a one-size-fits-all. I think it needs to be re re reviewed at fact, what, fact fine stage in a holistic way, um, and then yeah, elements of the strong points of each insurer's products presented to the customer so they can make an informed decision and um, perhaps that might be a few different providers to get what they really need. I absolutely love that idea because we talk about on the wealth side of financial services customers yeah. they understand portfolios they have their investments in different places uh -huh. and I think having that in the protection world uh, you know absolutely makes sense we've got a spread of providers in the marketplace who offer fantastic products and yeah. propositions but everybody does have their different niches mm -hmm. and I think if you can say to a customer right you've told me you wanted x y and z this is what I propose, it's all there laid in front. Yeah. We just need, again, now the tech to be able to help us with that. <laughs> yeah. And of course, 
time is marching on and these sessions always go a lot faster than you think I wanted to touch of course on Reese Williams's talk oh, yeah. it was so emotional but so relevant yeah. and yes he's saying we need to do more to educate people about protection we need to do more to to make it feel that it's valuable but ultimately his message was we need to tell more stories mm -hmm. whether that's more claims stories or whether it's just stories about what might happen if the unthinkable happens from a storytelling point of view therefore claire what do you think hsb hsbc's um method of telling stories would be following that emotional plea from reese yeah no it, it was a very emotional uh, video um so um i think it f from an advisor perspective when they're in front of customers um it's about perhaps encouraging um, the customer to be vulnerable and I think the way that you do that is by being vulnerable yourself and perhaps sharing some of your experiences um, uh, and, and reasons why perhaps you selected certain elements of cover um, so that it encourages the customer to do the same. Um, I had an advisor um, speaking to me uh, a couple of weeks ago and I'd done a session um, with their office on um, heart attack definitions um, uh, and and um, it had really resonated with the advisor. Um, he discussed with the customer um, uh, that this uh, they had had um, a, a close family friend who had recently died um, uh, after suffering a heart attack, uh, completely out of the blue. And so by having those um, conversations with the customer, he, he knew that the heart attack definition was really going to be important to this customer. Um, so, um, so by um, sharing that information, he, it, it was a, a, a really straightforward um, sale for the advisor and the, the uh, customer got a really strong product um, that met his needs, particularly when it came to that heart attack definition, which was a big concern to him. So yeah, being vulnerable uh, as an advisor, I think, is really important to encourage the customer to do the same. And Emma, are you a storyteller? I am. And if anybody who knows me is watching this will know I am. And that's actually, to be honest, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about the protection industry. When I was 19, my mum had a stroke and she had a critical illness payout. It was just me, her and my brother. She took the time off work to get better. I was looking after my brother who was doing his GCSEs at the time. And without that cover, well, who would have known what had happened? And there's another lady as an insurer that we all work with. And she can tell the story from a different perspective where her dad had to give up work and they had no critical illness policy in place. They had to move back from the country they were living into the UK. So for me, it is about finding a story the one resonates with you, but two with the customer. And I think even when I was working at the Friendly Societies, one of the things I always used to say was, everybody knows somebody who's been off with, mm. it doesn't even have to be something serious. Somebody's got a bad back, somebody suffers with migraines, they've broken an ankle, you know, anything, even minor things. We all know somebody. And it's just about saying, and how did that affect them financially? And making customers actually think about you know, what does it mean to me? I think one of the biggest things that we've done over the years is talk to customers about, you know, you need this to replace, say, for example, a critical illness policy. You need 50 grand critical illness. And they kind of go, but why do I need it? But if you say you are wanting to make sure their level of lifestyle, mm -hmm. so this loss aversion, yeah. they don't get to that point, mm -hmm that's what they resonate with and we all use the lines you know mine is the pet insurance one because I've got expensive dogs <laughs> but it's the same you know the Netflix it's, it's the internet I saw another piece of research the other day and the internet was the biggest thing people were unwilling to cancel it's about saying how do we maintain that lifestyle for you especially with cost of living crisis and everything else that's going on in the world at the moment so it's just about finding a story that fits with that customer. Thanks for that, for that Emma. Trust has been the theme of today and very briefly to finish, I don't know whether you do this already, and if you don't, is it possible? But how do you measure trust within your organisation? Is it even something that appears on the board agenda? And if it does, how do you measure it and make sure that trust is, is, is happening at all levels, from consumer to advisor to product provider? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, our voice of customer scores are incredibly important to us and everybody, every customer that goes through the claims process um, uh, 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 completes um, the, uh, the questionnaire so that we can get a really, really good indication of, of how the customer has found that experience. But I think what's really important, a lot of organisations record that information and they're very good at asking the customer, but do they actually analyse and do something about it? So it's not just about finding out um, about the customer's experience, but actually actioning it and ensuring that changes are made uh, where, when Im improvements are required. And Emma, what do you think about that? It's a really interesting one, because we, as you can imagine, at board level, we've got lots of tick boxes that we need to have, and better customer outcomes is our biggest one by far. And I guess that plays into it, because if you've got, you know, as a service provider, yeah. we have all these different elements to being a service provider and they come back to us for different elements. So I guess for me, that's what demonstrates the trust within Simply Biz, is that they don't just come to us for one service in particular, yeah. they come to us for quite a few across the board mm -hmm. rather than going anywhere else. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Emma. And I'm sure that everybody watching this will join me in thanking Claire and Emma for their participation today. And thank you so much for watching Protect X8. We really do enjoy putting these events together. We only thought we ever would do one during the pandemic, and here we are on Protect X8. So thank you once again from everybody on the Protection Review team for tuning in today. A couple of events coming up, I mentioned earlier, we have Protect Z. Yes, it's Protect Z, not Protect Z, even though it's Gen <laughs> Z, I guess. Protect Z is on the 19th of June in London. All the speakers under the age of 30. Okay. And the 27th of November, a full Protection Review conference dinner and awards, as always, at the fantastically opulent Landmark Hotel in London. Thank you so much for watching Protect X8 and we will see you again in the near future.